What's up, guys? Uh, this is Zach Joaquin uh, from the Richmond Times Dispatch. This is On the Horn. Uh, I'm coming at you live from, as you can see, outside Barclays Center. The uh, the subway entrance is behind me. The You Belong Here sign. Uh, we got all the vibes. Um, BCU 69, Fordham 62. Um, ugly, ugly game, right? But but the Rams survive in advance. Um, I used the survive in advance line in my story uh, for print tomorrow because that felt so appropriate with, with how this one went, right? Um, it was ugly. It was a physical game. Uh, BCU shot 39 free throws, ended up 27 of 39 from the line, and that was kind of their saving grace down the stretch. Um, did not have a field goal in the last 846, I think, of that game, or 841. Uh, Christian Furman's push shot with a little less than nine minutes to go was their last field goal, um, and it's wild to, to win a game that you didn't have a field goal over that extended stretch toward the end there. Uh, but the same, they did because the same was true for Fordham. I think Fordham's last field goal came with like 646 to play. Um, I believe it was, a, it was a Kyle Rose layup. And then it was all free throws for both teams down the stretch. Um, really physical game. I don't even think, you know, it, there was some inconsistent officiating for sure, but I don't think the refs called it crazy tight. I think that was appropriate um, given how physical Fordham was. Um, they only shot 18 free throws. Um, so not a whole lot of calls on VCU going the other way. Um, but nip and tuck first half, right? 38, 37 Fordham at the break. Um, Kyle Rose had 16 points in the first half and made a few threes. And VCU really clamped down defensively in the second half, specifically on Rose. Um, we asked Max Shulga and Zeb Jackson about the defensive effort in the second half um, after that one. And they both talked about kind of some conversations among the players about what Rose's spots were and what kind of shots he was trying to get to. He hit a few step backs in that first half. Um, and so they did a lot better job of limiting him in the second half. Um, and that was huge and only allowing 24 points and be able to, being able to come out with a win. I thought Fordham got away from a zone uh, that they were running in that first half and probably didn't run it uh, as much as they could have in the second half. Maybe VCU kind of figured out how to break it down a little bit, but they were playing this kind of extended amorphous 2-3, sometimes looked like a 1-3-1. Maybe sometimes it was a 2-3 and sometimes it was a 1-3-1 in that first half. And it really slowed VCU's offensive pace down and made them play really slow and got the ball out of Max Shulga's hands at the top of the key, right? And goodness me, where would this team be this year without Max Shulga, your first team all-conference honoree? 14 points, seven rebounds, uh, four assists in this game. Only took four shots. He ended up four or four from the field. Um, two of them were threes and four or four from the free throw line. I think if you're a VCU fan, ideally, you'd really like Max to have more volume than that and to get up more shots. But I think part of that was he was obviously the top of the scouting report um, for Fordham coming into this game, and they really keyed off on him. I thought they kind of did some similar things to what St. Louis did, the St. Louis women did on Sarah Tebiasu um, in the in the A-10 women's tournament. Um, last week when St. Louis knocked VCU out, they were bringing the, uh, the two guards at the top of that zone really extended far out and doubling her at the top of the key and forcing someone else to initiate VCU's offense, and Fordham kind of did that a little bit with their zone today. They just made Shulga give it up and tried to make somebody else beat them, even though Shulga still ended up leading VCU with 14 points. Toby Lawal, man, 9 of 11 at the free throw line. He ended up with 13 points, 6 rebounds, um, 9 of 11 at the free throw line. That's clutch. It kind of reminded me of the Davidson game um, when VCU trailed by 9 late in that one and, and then really locked down defensively and won at the line with free throws late in that game. And Toby made a lot of free throws in that game um, in, in key moments. And for a guy that has at times struggled at the line this year, for him to, to make 9 of 11 was huge. Uh, Zeb Jackson, 10 points, 5 steals is the big stat that, that stands out to me for, for Zeb. He was outstanding defensively, especially in that second half. He was a big part of the effort to really lock down um, on Kyle Rose because he killed VCU in that first half. Fordham didn't get a whole lot going outside of Rose. I mean, to Simbi to Sim to is that how you, is that how you say it? I'm probably butchering that. It's T S I M B I L A. Number thirty. They're they're big man. Um, had a few buckets in the first half. They limited him well in the second. I mean, he ended up with ten points, um, but he did not kill them. And and VC moves on to to face UMass at two o'clock here tomorrow, which feels appropriate, doesn't it? It feels like that's the team that they should have to get past after how bad Amherst was a few weeks ago. I think the final was 74-52 there, right? That was probably VCU's worst game that they played all year. Um, that, that start was terrible, and they just never recovered from it in that game. Cross and Cohen for UMass both ended up on the A-10 first team, um, and they both killed VCU. And so we'll be fascinated to see what the game plan is on Cohen tomorrow. Um, that's Everyone knows that VCU has struggled against true fives who can score with their back to the basket this year, um, and that's very much what Cohen is. They really struggled against him in that first matchup 
And so I would look for them to, Deron Holmes is a very different player to Josh Cohen, but probably use some of the things that they did so effectively against Holmes in that matchup at the Seagull Center uh, when VCU won 49-47 in that defensive slog against Dayton. They did a great job of not letting Holmes post up um, deep toward the basket, right, to be able to just turn and, and score over his shoulder, use his athleticism to get to the rim. They forced him to catch further out, and they brought doubles really quick. And so if you can force Cohen to catch a little further away from the basket and be aggressive about bringing doubles. I was on the three-bid league uh, podcast um, this afternoon. I'm sorry, by the way, this took me so long to, to get up uh, online after the game. I was finishing up my story um, and then did the podcast for a little bit there. Um, and took a while to get out of Barclays Center. That place is a maze, by the way. I got lost like five or six times today. I think uh, uh, AWOD had to, had to help me find my way quite a few times to the media room. And I missed the food, guys. I missed the food. They cut it off at 5.30. I was working on my story right after the game went final and, and grinding away in the media room, and I didn't get there in time. And I tried to go in there at like 6 and get food because they had that, like some tortellini and some meatballs, and it looked really good, and I didn't get any of it. They had steak yesterday for the media, which is which is unheard of. So I'm going to have to get here earlier tomorrow. Um, we'll probably try and get here before the Richmond game tomorrow to watch that one too. Um, I think they played 11.30 right before VCU UMass. But back to UMass, I mean, bring doubles on Cohen aggressively because UMass is they, – they, I didn't realize this, but the um, Tyler from the 3-Bid League pod mentioned it to me. They're the worst three-point shooting team on the season statistically in the A-10. And so you can be aggressive with bringing those doubles, you know, from, from your perimeter defenders, right? You can leave their guys at the three-point line. If UMass beats you by, by hitting threes, then, then you tip your cap to them because that's not how they've won games all year. And so I think you, you be aggressive, bring the double on Cohen. Don't let him get deep and post. Um, you know, try him. I always have a hand in his face. Don't leave Toby and Firm um, alone down there to deal with them to deal with him because it's not a, a fair matchup for them um, to try and just have to guard him one-on-one -on -one in the post, especially for Toby, who's who's undersized against a, a true five like that. I think Cohen is 6'10", right? And he's and he's a load. I want to say I don't have the numbers in front of me, but he's like 250 or something like that. That's a guess. He's a big guy, um, and he loves that, just the basic you know hook shot over his shoulder um, that, that so many effective back-to-the-basket bigs love to get to. Um, so don't let him get to that shot. Don't let him catch deep. Um, and then put a body on Matt Cross. I, I, I love watching that guy play. He's incredibly tenacious, wonderfully high energy levels, can do a little bit of everything on the floor. I think he killed VCU on the glass um, in Amherst, and so that'll be key. Maybe look for Sean Bairstow um, to, to get that matchup. Sean Bairstow is, is a good rebounder and very good at body positioning with boxing out. Uh, Ryan Odom has talked about that a little bit this year. And so maybe look for, for Bairstow, that to be one of his primary assignments. Um, putting a body on Matt Cross because they cannot let him crash the glass like he did last game. I'm sorry, we have an ambulance pulling up to Barclays Center here. And so if you can't hear me, then, then that's why. That's why I wanted to do it out front of Barclays Center to get, the, uh, to get all of the vibes and stuff. My uh, inspiration for these videos um, is uh, James McNicholas from uh, um, Ars Blog, and he covers Arsenal for The Athletic. And he does uh, uh, on the whistle after Arsenal games, and he always does them outside the Emirates. Uh, so I, I love those vibes, and he always has fans walking up to him and stuff. And so that's why I'm out front Barclays today. Um, anything else to say about this game? Uh, I remember I used a moment, Bryce Crawford, who's one of my favorite VCU uh, assistants, very demonstrative, um, over on the sideline. There was a moment with about six and a half minutes to play where I think he stomped his feet. Um, he slapped the floor. He was asking for defensive intensity, um, it seemed to me, as, as Fordham was bringing the ball up. And VCU certainly had that in the latter stages of this game, right? Um, it wasn't pretty. They didn't have a whole lot of flow offensively, but Fordham can do that to you. Tip of the cap to Fordham. I think there's probably a lot in the VCU fan base who kind of admire their style of basketball, right? They want to turn you over. They want to speed you up. There's, there's certainly some crossover with what the identity of the VCU program has been for a long time. Um, and so, man, they're tough. They're physical. You hope that the attrition uh, from the physicality of this game doesn't carry over into tomorrow and affect VCU against UMass. Um, but I also think that uh, VCU might have a bit of an advantage, and I asked Ryan Odom about that um, in the in the post game presser when he was talking to to me and Adam Epstein um, outside of the of the media room. And he said he's not so sure there's an advantage to it, but VCU certainly you know can benefit off the fact that they've played two tightly contested games. Um, recently, right, the, the, the game at Dayton on Friday, um, and then this one, you know, two high-stakes um, games. And UMass hasn't played in a week. You know, they had that last weekend of the season off. So I believe they haven't played since last Wednesday. So it's going to be eight days 
that since UMass has taken the court, um, and that's a span that VCU has played two games in, that can be a blessing and a curse. Um, we'll see what it is tomorrow. Certainly, you know, they'll have fresher legs than VCU. But I think in those first seven, eight minutes, VCU might be able to get into a rhythm faster than UMass is. Um, we'll see if the if that layoff affects the Minutemen and if VCU can can kind of harness the um, the rhythm of having had two hotly contested games um, in a short span here. Uh, you're probably eager for the quick turnaround and just to, to get back out there, you know, and, and play tomorrow. So maybe they can use that to their advantage. Um, does anything else stand out on the box score? Kawani had nine points. He was good. He was good, especially in that first half. Um, using his length to disrupt things defensively. Um, need him to start hitting from outside again, right? He had that stretch like a third of the way through the season um, where he really got hot from outside and was shooting a ridiculous percentage in A-10 play for a while, and he's cooled off. Um, he was 0-3 from three today. Um, BC certainly needs him to to get going a little bit from outside. And Joe Bamisil, right, only eight points tonight. That's certainly encouraging, I think, if you're VCU, that you can, that you can put up 69 and win a game in which Joe really didn't get going. I mean, he was two of six from the floor. He missed his first, I think it was six free throws too. Um, this says two of seven. I, I thought he was two of eight um, from the line, but he missed his first. Maybe he was 0 for five leading into that one. He was really struggling at the line and then made two when it mattered most. So that was great to say, see, even though Joe really struggled at the line kind of uh, consistently tonight for him to, to figure it out and make the two that mattered the most uh, was big, but he obviously was not on tonight and you still put up almost 70 points. So, I mean, if, if Joe can catch fire a little bit and, and get going in this tournament, then that brings VCU's ceiling offensively um, to, a, to a place that it obviously can't be at when, when Joe's not hot because he's such a prolific scorer and the rest of this team really feeds off of his energy um, when he can get going. So uh, I think that's about it, guys. I can't think of anything else. Um, if you have any other takeaways from this game, you know, let me know in the comments. Um, Looking forward to UMass tomorrow. Again, it just really feels like that's the boogeyman in the closet for VCU because Amherst was so bad. Um, and and if they can get past UMass, then you've already you've beaten Dayton, you've pushed Dayton to the brink in overtime. You know, at UD Arena, you beat Loyola, you beat Richmond, and you push Richmond to the brink at, at Robbins Center. And so I think VCU is going to have a lot of confidence that they can get to Saturday. Um, but tomorrow is the key, right? The I think the UMass game is everything. If they can win, then I think they have a chance to win this whole tournament um and we'll have a lot of confidence going into saturday so thank you guys so much for watching um i know there's more vcu fans coming up here tomorrow but the support was great today um at barclays center and uh, if vcu can win tomorrow and get to saturday then i'm sure ram nation will uh, will be turning out um in earnest for for what will be a really fun game on saturday if they can get there um thank you guys so much for tuning in we'll see you tomorrow